We're in a series uh, about arguing with Jesus. Who did Jesus argue with? What did Jesus argue about? One of the things we're discovering is an argument with Jesus usually was pretty short. Uh, today is not the exception of the rule, but we talked about an argument that Jesus had with some folks about the afterlife and human relationships, an argument that Jesus had about what was the most important rules, and today we're going to have a conversation that Jesus, uh, look at a conversation, an argument Jesus had about politics. Now some of you are sitting here right now and going, dear God, why did I come here today? And others of you are going, thank God, finally he's going to say something that matters. And uh, what I want you to know is uh, Jesus' approach to this issue is really important for us to pay attention to and really important for how we think about the challenges that our own culture faces. In Mark chapter 12, it says, later they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. I'll kind of give you an idea as to their positions on some things in a minute. They sent them to Jesus to catch him in his words. And they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You are, not, you are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. How many know this already feels like a setup, right? <laughs> Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay it or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were amazed at him. If you don't know, I think you probably do, but I'll just remind us all this morning is that Calvary Assembly is a politics-free zone. Uh, we do not weigh in on political party, political legislation, political agenda. And uh, I am regularly asked to do so by people who feel very strongly and passionately about some things. And often those issues are framed in religious language. And uh, as a Christian, don't you think, and, and this is what's happening to Jesus in this moment. They're coming to him and they're trying to fit political agendas into religious language so they can get religious leaders to choose sides. Uh, our culture has actually become increasingly partisan in politics. And so consequently, every time a political leader says or does something, there is a desire and quite honestly now an impulse for religious people to weigh in on it. Somebody says or does something and either you're for it or against it, either you believe it or you don't believe it and you're required to weigh in on it. And, and, and once you weigh in on it, uh, a lot of things happen and almost none of them are good. So as far as we know, there are people of every political persuasion that are part of our church family. We have Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and progressives. We probably have some Green Party. We probably have some Libertarians. We, we might even have a communist in here, I'm not sure. And uh, we've got certain socialists. We got, we, got every, we got everything in here. And, I, and some of you are becoming very uneasy right now. Just, they're in here? <laughs> and uh, they are. Um, what you should know about is this. I do not believe that the best use of our time when we are together is to try to inform individuals on how to think about political processes, legislative processes. And I understand that sometimes those things can have moral implications in our culture. And that's always the, the term that's used. This is not a political issue, it's a moral issue. It's a political issue when the agenda is political, when the language is political, when it's on a political uh, action item list, and now I'm being asked to weigh in on it. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, when church and politics get together in the same place, what usually happens is not edifying. Uh, some people just get trampled on. So I actually don't think it's my goal. I had a person one time after service 
tell me, uh, it was after a, a politician had made an action, uh, made a decision, and, and he, he caught me when I left the auditorium and he said, you need to tell people what to think. <laughs> and I said, that is not my job. What I hope to do is to help people learn how to think and let them figure it out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just, just look at somebody next to you and, and tell them, God wants you to think. He does. He wants you to think. So there, as you've probably noticed, there's a fair amount of tension in our culture over politics these days, by the way. Uh, that's nothing new. And by the way, not just to American experience. Throughout the course of history, wherever there are political leaders, wherever there's political action, you're always going to have strong viewpoints. And in fact, in Jesus' day, the exact same thing is happening. There are two groups that are listed. One is the Pharisees, one of the Herodians. And what's uh, frustrating them is, is that Rome has now moved in and militarily occupied Israel. So Israel was its own nation, and that is no longer true. Uh, they are still allowed to keep their identity as Israel in some ways, but in every way of, of political reality, uh, positions of power are determined by people from Rome. And so there's one group of people who just think that is a completely illegitimate government. We didn't ask them to come here. Uh, all they do is take from us and impose on us. And it's an illegitimate government. And someday someone's going to rise up. A Messiah's going to come. And he's going to drive these people out of our land. And we look for that day. And that group is the Pharisees. And then there's the Herodians. Now, the Herodians are not a religious sect. They are religious people, but they are politically motivated. And they actually believe that God is the one who puts people in power and that when they align themselves with those who are in power, that they gain influence, not only with the powers that be, but with others, and some good can come out of it. In fact, they would go so far as to say that the person who was Tiberius Caesar, who was on the throne of Rome, that he actually is the Messiah, that he has come to bring salvation to the nation of Israel. So obviously two very different political viewpoints. So... The Herodians, who saw opportunities and thought that the political leader was the savior of the nation, and the Pharisees, who saw this as an illegitimate government, and the savior would come and overthrow it someday. And so they set Jesus up. We know that you're a man of integrity. By the way, if you believe it, you don't have to say it. Right? But they want, they want to frame the question. They're setting him up so that he feels a little bit more free to speak a little bit more boldly. And so they, they frame the question. You're a person of integrity. You don't play favorites. You're not afraid of anyone. You always speak the truth. So do we pay taxes or not? Yes or no? Which is what people do, right? They try to reduce everything to a yes. Are you for this or are you against it? Is it yes or no? What is it? Can I tell you something? The gospel is simple, but people are complicated. And politics is complicated. And our culture is complicated. And sin is complicated. And Jesus would not allow them to box him into a yes or no answer. I know that frustrates people who want to put you in a particular box. But Jesus refuses to say yes or no. Why did they want Jesus to weigh in on political issues? And the first reason is this, to label him, to label him. By the way, our culture likes to label people too. We want to cast people in a very narrow view and an unflattering light. And uh, it's not enough just to disagree with people. We have to label them. We have to vilify them. They're not just wrong. They're dangerous. That's what we do. And in our culture, we will go back and find something you have said, something you have written, something that you did maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. And as soon as we have that piece of information, that's who you are. You're that person. Thank God. God, there wasn't Twitter when I was 16 years old. 
very little of what I said and done is retrievable in modern media. And I am grateful I was born when I was born. Because there are people who would pull stuff up and they'd say, look what you said. Look what you did. And this is what I want you to know. A culture does that because our culture is undeniably convinced you will never change if you've ever said something or you've ever done anything. That's who you are. And Jesus refuses to accept that there is a single person who cannot change. One of the great passages in Scripture is it lists all these horrific sins and terrible attitudes, bad behavior. And, and then this is what it says. This is what Paul says. And such were some of you. Isn't that great? To label. That's what people like to do. They like to label, and then they want to neutralize him. See, when you neutralize someone, as soon as you put them in their box, you can at least tune them out. Or, in this particular case, they may have been trying to trick him into saying something that the government would respond to. Because believe it or not, in not too recent history before Jesus, there was an individual who was a religious leader who believed that the government was illegal and illegitimate, and he told people not to pay taxes, and he actually went in and cleansed the temple. And for that, he was arrested, he was tried, and he was executed. So there are some people that are hoping they can get Jesus to overstep and overspeak so they can neutralize him and get him out of the way. And then some people just want to feel better. If you say what I believe, oh, that will make me feel so good. So, just like in our text today, there are some people who see the government as the enemy, and there are some people who see the government as the savior. And Jesus won't go into either camp. Uh, Jesus, when he's being set up, he's not just interested in our words, and he's not just interested in our actions. Jesus is interested in our motives, and he sees them very clearly. It's very challenging for the people who were talking to him because they managed their, their words and their actions very well. But he cuts right to their motives. So he asked for a coin, a denarius. And they brought him the coin, and he looks at it, and he says, whose image is this? And it's the image of Caesar. And he says, there's an inscription on it, and who's it about? And they said, it's about Caesar. And in fact, they have coins. They've dug these things up. They, they exist. You can find them. Uh, they're in museums. And, and, and the name on the coin was Tiberius Caesar. And this is what it said. So it's his image and then an inscription that said, Tiberius Caesar, the son of the divine Augustus. This is what it says. This is Caesar, the son of God. Think about that. The king who is the son of God is holding a coin who says someone else is the king and the son of God. By the way, how would you feel about spending money that said a political leader was the son of God? And so Jesus pulls this coin out and he, he looks at it. And by the way, there's one more thing about this tax. This was not a property tax and it wasn't a sales tax. This was a special tax. It was a special tax on anyone who is not a citizen of Rome. So if you were a citizen, you didn't have to pay this tax. But if you were not a citizen, you had to pay this tax just because you had the privilege of living under the occupation of a country you were not a citizen of. It wasn't a lot of money. It's a small amount. It was the amount that was given the poorest of slaves for a day's work. And so that's the tax, and that's the image and Jesus doesn't pick sides. That's the most frustrating thing about Jesus, isn't it? And the most wonderful thing about Jesus. He doesn't choose sides. He didn't pick a political party. And he still doesn't. I know I might burst your bubble, but Jesus is not a Democrat. And he's not an American. He's not a Republican. He's not any of those things. He's Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings the Lord of Lords. And so that's who Jesus is. So he, he doesn't weigh in one side or the other. He won't, and this is interesting too. He doesn't say that the government has no authority. He just says the government doesn't have all authority. 
He's just, he's so wise in his response. I wish, I wish we could just have this wisdom infiltrate our hearts and our minds so that we could respond in our culture the way Jesus responded in his. Um, Jesus is saying, of course there has to be government. and Of course there have to be groups of people who try to make things better in the world. But he said it doesn't mean that they have all authority. So why are people who are motivated to do good wind up doing harm? And the answer is, is that our culture actually idolizes four things. And the first thing is that we idolize power. Every culture has. If you have power, you can make a difference. If you have power, you can impose your will. So the only way you really make a difference in our world is to get some position of power. And so you have to know that if that power is threatened, then you become an adversary of people who are in power. They will do what they can to try to to at least make you look silly, if not eliminate your influence altogether. And here is Caesar, whose goal is to keep the power that he has. And we are confronted by an individual who actually surrenders power. We heard the passage from Philippians this morning. He considered himself equal with God, but he gave it all up. And he took on the form of a servant, and he humbled himself. See, our culture idolizes power, and we only have respect for people who have it because we think they're the ones that make the difference. And we idolize success. Having more makes you feel more important. We want to do well. We want to have more. Even the American dream, right, is that our kids would have better than we have. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. It's a good goal. We want to give. We want to help the next generation do better. But we can turn that from a good thing and make it into a God thing. And so now the problem is, is that those who are more successful, we feel like we are less when we are around them. And then there's comfort. Because nobody likes to be uncomfortable, right? What did Caesar do? Caesar lived in palaces. I will tell you, there's not a hotel still that was as luxurious as anything that man lived in or stayed in or slept in. It was absolutely wonderful. Every one of us would love to have been a guest in the royal palace where Caesar lived. It was a place of great opulence and great comfort. And yet we see in Jesus, he wasn't a person who pursued comfort. He didn't idolize that. And then there's recognition. Caesar made sure it was his name that was on the coin. Caesar made sure that any building that got erected, his name was there. Caesar made sure that there was icons and statues all through the culture that reminded everyone who's in power. I built this. I made this. I'm the one who runs the military. I'm the one who's in power. I want the recognition that I deserve. And in Jesus, you see someone who's actually quite different from that. Jesus did not seek power. He didn't seek it. He gave it up. He did not seek success. When others tried to crown him a king, he rejected their crown and walked away from it. The Bible tells us he didn't even have a place to sleep. He's like the original couch surfer. He used to just sleep in the houses of friends. Jesus did not seek comfort. He, he walked on dusty, dirty, hot roads, and he slept on the ground and in borrowed beds, and he did not seek any special treatment. He didn't get special accommodations when he went anywhere, and he didn't seek recognition. He always gave his father credit. He said, everything that I say that is wise, it comes from him. Everything that I do that demonstrates power, it's because he showed me how to do it. Always giving all credit to, to his heavenly father. There was, there was a coin that he's holding that had the image of another king. There's no coin that's ever been minted that ever has the image of Jesus on it. He didn't need that kind of recognition or accreditation. And yet, and yet, who do one out of every four people on the face of the planet declare to be their king? He didn't surrender to any of the idols, and his influence is still unbelievable in our world. The reason that Jesus did not misuse power is because he prioritized people over power or over position. 
One time he was treated with great disrespect. He, he spoke in a city and it didn't go well. Not only did they not listen to him, they told him they didn't like him. They threatened him and they told him that he and his disciples had to leave immediately. And his disciples had a brilliant idea. Let us call fire down out of heaven and let's destroy them. Why? Because their power was being threatened. They were not getting the recognition they deserved. They were not feeling comfortable. Nothing was going the way they wanted. So they had a brilliant idea. Let's, and, and think about it. This is a win-win for them, right? Not only does it shut the mouths of those who are rejecting them, but their reputation will precede them. And the next place they go, they will get a warm welcome or they will leave a warm exit. <laughs> That's how it works. And Jesus just looked at him and said, you don't even know what spirit is driving your words right now. He said, I did not come to take life. I came to give life. Jesus won't misuse success because he didn't come to get. He came to give. He doesn't try to make himself comfortable. Even on the night that he's betrayed, he's washing the feet of the disciples around him. It's not comfortable. And you refuse to demand credit for anything. In our world, if you try to take someone's power, you become an adversary and you must be dealt with. If you don't have enough success, you feel like you are less. If you are not comfortable, I mean, there's a reason why right now that the, the chairs you are sitting on have cushions. Because you just stopped listening to me five, 10, 21 minutes ago. <laughs> if if we don't get the recognition we deserve, we quit or we cut people out of our lives. This, the thing that ruins everything and everyone is in us. We're not exempt. We rail against people who have power and we misuse it when we get it. And we will not be the exception to that rule. But Jesus was. That's why he made the difference. The tendency is to blame, and blaming is just a form of self-righteousness. If they were, they are weak, they are uninformed, they are unenlightened, they are uncommitted, they are uncaring. That's why the world is the way is, it is. It's because of them. You see, do you hear that? If, if, they, if everyone was like me, this world would be better. If everyone was like you, this world would be better for you. Nobody else. So what's Jesus' solution? Jesus' solution is to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He did not say, give to Caesar what Caesar wants. Give to Caesar what bears his image. There are coins that have his image on it. Give that to him. See, your faith does not exempt you from obligations in the culture and the country you live in. I know some Christians who pride themselves on never lying and, and never stealing and never swearing, but they don't pay their taxes. And they consider themselves morally superior to other people. Jesus did not say, don't pay your taxes. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He does not say the government has no place. He does not say politics is completely out of bounds. What he says is, is it needs to maintain its proper place. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. There's a coin with Caesar's image on it, but when every time you look into the eyes of another human being, they have been created in the image and the likeness of God. And we are to give ourselves to the true and the living God. You might have to give some money and some space and some time for other things, but God is the one who deserves all of our lives. We're to give him our lives. We're to give him our worship. We're to give him our trust. It's amazing to me how often people will worship politics. It's, it's an altar that people bow down. If, if that person were just in power, oh, what a wonderful life we would have. What a great country this would be. All of our problems would be solved. Okay. But I've seen lots of people make those promises. And I've seen lots of people try really hard. And they couldn't accomplish what they desired. And yet we continue to put our trust in those systems, in those parties, and in those governments. 
Our faith does not mean that we shouldn't be involved in organized efforts to try to find solutions to real problems. Our faith does not mean that you should avoid politics. I'm not saying that you should leave here this morning and, and go out and, and, and turn in your, your uh, affiliation from whatever political party that you belong in. I'm not saying that you shouldn't vote. In fact, I think all those things are true. But please hear me. If you are part of a political party, accept it for what it is. Help them do the good that they can do. But stop thinking that they are the savior of the world and that any other thing is just an illegitimate expression of stupidity. We have to get off that bus. Because when we talk like that, the world tunes us out and we lose our voice. We need to talk about the things that matter when we are here. And if something's important to you, you can participate in that. But please understand, that is limited power. God is the one with unlimited power. Jesus came to change our world one life at a time, not one election <laughs> at a time. Let's bow our heads. The, the truth is, there's only one who is willing to give his life instead of take life to fix what's wrong in this world. The only opinion that mattered to him was that of his heavenly father. And so Jesus wasn't trapped in moments like that where the goal is to label him or neutralize him or just make people feel better. Rather, what Jesus did was to help people understand we can respect government for what it can do, but we're also understanding of what it cannot do. The best intended political person, political party, the best intended government wants to create justice and wholeness and, and prosperity. But Jesus understood that it's always at the issue of the heart that everything goes wrong. And if we keep pursuing all the same things that our world pursues, wrapping a cross around your neck or holding a Bible in your hand will not get you to a different location. We all wind up in the same place. So Jesus calls us to give to God the things that belong to God. And when we do that, the change starts right in us. And the one thing our world is not used to seeing is lives that have actually been changed, not just the promise of it. So Father, help us today. These are challenges for us in a culture in which we live. Your son Jesus knew how to walk in a way and how to address these issues so that he wasn't just put in one camp or another, but he helped everyone to see who he is, why he came. Help us to be that kind of person too. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.